okay we're into an episode of on the wrist from off the cuff to have a really cool review for you guys from the brand seiko a little about them they're founded back in 1881 they are japanese in origin and not back through throughout asia they cover all market segments from entry level to high end and in terms of the type of watch i consider this an everyday watch some key common characteristics and language you're looking for something you can wear every day of course you're just gonna be looking for that versatile blend of sporty and dressy attributes this is the prospects alpinus sje085 it is a 1959 piece limited edition of the 1959 Laurel Alpinus recreation. And essentially it was Seiko's job to recreate the original Seiko Adventurer's watch from the late 50s. And here you have it. It was only a matter of time. You guys know I'm a big Seiko Alpinus collector and just a Seiko uh, connoisseur in general. But the nice thing is I actually got this lent in from Belmont Watches. This is a mint condition example. They're actually letting this go for 2100 versus the 2900 MSRP. So you're gonna be saving quite a pretty penny if you decide to pull the trigger on this particular unit. So with all that said, let's go ahead, zoom the camera out, get this piece in hand and take a closer look. Okay guys, so what a beauty. And again, big thank you to Belmont Watches in San Diego. Now check this out. So this one's really stood out since the day that it was released. I think what a lot of people were turned off about, we'll start with, right? First thing, it's the way they shoehorned in the date complication. The nice thing is they're actually using a black date disc. So it actually kind of disappears when you're not really looking for it, right? Some of you are gonna say, I can't unsee it. And hey, that's fair. Uh, but honestly, it's one of those quirks that I'm kind of okay with. Um, for me, I think it's just a little bit small at 36 and a half millimeters in diameter. It is nicely uh, thin at 11.1 .1 millimeters thick. And that's including that beautiful box dome sapphire with an inner AR coating. It's only 43.8 millimeters lug to lug, so this is going to look fantastic on a number of different wrists. It is actually full polished stainless steel with, of course, that Seiko proprietary hard coating, also known as Dia Shield. Now, that crystal is, whew, that is just half the battle, guys. That is just beautifully executed. And of course, full in-house Seiko glory in terms of them growing their own sapphires. So you do have that nice box dome sapphire and it does have their super clear air coating. So if you do tend to get a reflection, you're not gonna have any other colors intruding in to distract from the beautiful dial itself. Now, when we get to the uh, rest of the layout here, of course, you're gonna have a fixed bezel. There's no inner rotating. Uh, compass bezel. This is just kind of before all of that design language when it comes to the Alpinus. This is the original Alpinus and it was a very simple kind of dressy, very explorer-like type of setup in that it is versatile. Uh, it is meant to be a field watch, but at the same time, it's also quite simple and very much within that kind of mid-century vibe. It does have a push-pull crown while still maintaining 10 bar or 100 meters of water resistance. And inside, although you can't see it, it has the uh, Seiko 6L35, which is a great movement. You guys have had seen me talk about this in you know various other videos and various other watches it's not cheap uh but it is very nice it is fully in house and uh you know it's been around for a long time it originally started out as kind of the 4l25 eventually becoming the 4l75 and then the 6l uh 35 and then now there's even other variations beyond that and even if you go into seiko's very high-end credor line you'll find watches that have the 6l75 so there's quite a few reasons to like this movement but one of the main ones is that it's very very thin and it is very good it does also have that high uh hertz sweep so it's gonna have that four Hertz beat rate at 28,800 vibrations per hour. It's gonna have a 45 hour power reserve and relatively will keep time anywhere in between plus 15 to minus 10 seconds per day. And of course it's gonna keep much better time than that, but those are the ultimate um, boundaries and in, in terms of uh, what that's gonna offer. And honestly, that is comparable to something that you would find like in let's say a top grade ETA uh, 2890. 
2, which would be comparable in terms of the thinness, uh, etc. Now, uh, getting it to this beautiful dial, guys, it is classic. I love the symmetry, and that is one of the things they were able to achieve by, let's give this a quick little spritz here, by, and you know what, let's just give it a, big, a quick little wipe off camera as well while we're here, just because it is fully polished, and you know what, fingerprints are going to be pretty evident. Um, there we go. That's that's the ticket. Look at that. So, really nice applied indices. Of course, polished surrounds. You're getting this beautiful, deep, glossy black dial. You do have the date uh, sandwiched in at kind of the four and a half o'clock in between four and five. Uh, it does have a black wheel, though, which does help with integration. It does have polished hands uh, that are loomed with the hour and minute, and then actually a white-tipped seconds hand, which I don't think anybody really talks about because they probably don't even notice it because it is very subtle, but very much appreciated when you take a look at that. Again, push-pull crown, to maintain that 10 bar or 100 meters of water resistance. As long as the crown's pushed in, you'll be good to go. It does have 18 millimeter lugs, and for me, that was one of the drawbacks. 18 millimeter lugs, not too thrilled because I do have a larger wrist, but it does come on this brown leather bond stra style strap that tapers down to 16 millimeters at this really unique signed buckle. Check that out, the old school Seiko S. Very nice, fully milled, even the finger here zigzag pattern it definitely gives you that adventure vibe and of course this is a new example so um you know it's pretty much only been uh you know uh, used in terms of display um but you can see like this isn't even ever really been broken in so it's going to be quite flat but a lot of people of course can uh you can pull this out and just wear it normal but since i do have a bit of a thicker wrist at seven and a half inches um for me an 18 uh, millimeter strap might look a little thin especially when you think about the uh the really nice decorative uh stitching that they did here which is great if you have a smaller wrist, you won't notice it as much, but on a larger wrist, it's going to make this seem even skinnier. It's kind of like when you have a small dial on a small watch. It just shrinks it down even more. So when you have big stitching on already pretty thin strap there at 18 millimeters tapering down to 16 millimeters, it's visually going to look even smaller. The good news is not everybody has a big wrist like me. So a lot of you uh, will be rejoicing and celebrating for, uh, you know, to be able to find something that is this tailored, that is this refined and timeless, um, that at is, at is, you know, a very reasonable size. And again, although it doesn't have the 200 meters of water resistance, the modern Alpinists are known for, 100 meters is more than enough. And 100 meters for something that is this dressy is actually a real bonus. So really, when I think about this watch, I don't think of it as much as, you know, uh, an alternative to a modern alpinist. I think of it as much more of an alternative to, let's say, a vintage 36 millimeter explorer that you would wear on a strap because you like that style. Uh, because now you can do that here. Honestly, after spending some time with this, I think this is actually the perfect candidate for, um, you know, one of those nice rivet bracelets from Forstner. I think that would look excellent. If you have one of these, or if you buy this one and you do that, tag me in it. Like, I want to see how that looks. I want to see that combination because I think that would look absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, ooh, it almost makes me want to pick this piece up, but I have uh, one too many, uh, probably more than one too many, but a lot of, uh, you know, Seikos already, and then even within, especially now these days, within some of their higher tier stuff. So, unfortunately, I won't be able to add one of these to the collection, at least not at this time, but if I did, I would absolutely put it on that Forstner uh, rivet strap, as I a bracelet, I should say, because I think that would just look fantastic and really, again, tie in to that 1950s, late 1950s aesthetic really, really beautifully. Uh, and of course, just like Forstner, uh, with these modern reissues, you're going to be getting much better build quality, much tighter tolerances, while still recapturing all of that beauty, charm, and desirability. 
So I know some of you have just been watching this video staring at the date and you're like, ah, and some of you have just forgotten about it and cool. Like if you can overlook the date window, I think you're gonna really find something very, very special here. Now, I don't wanna put this on my wrist, uh, at least tightening it because it is a leather strap, right? I, I think the person whoever buys this should be the one to kind of break it in, but I will lay it like this so you guys can see. Of course, if I do get my wrist a bit too close to the camera, what's gonna end up happening is it's going to make the watch appear much larger, right? You're gonna get some perspective distortion. So what I like to do is keep my wrist nice and low. So we'll pop this out, big shout out again and thank you to our friends over at Belmont Watches. But what I'll do is I'll keep my wrist down low and lay this here and you can see very well centered on the wrist especially with this bun strap, which does elongate and, and you know give you more wrist presence. So for somebody with a large wrist, this bun strap or any type of bun strap, you know, of course they're not, you know, Seiko's not the only one to make this type of strap. Uh, you'd be very happy with something like this. Um, and again, if it was me, I would do, you know, that beautiful rivet bracelet uh, from Forstner. I think it would just look outstanding, especially with the uh, flat and links oh man that look killer but you can see here it does sit really nice and you know in the spirit of a true tool watch um and a field watch at that this is very unobtrusive and will stay out of the way in terms of just being a good piece of kit that you can use that's not going to overwhelm or overpower anything so with that said let's actually get this piece set up for some loom shots low light transition and closing thoughts okay let's go ahead and hit the lights here Okay guys, as you can see, really nice legible loom and you don't necessarily need that when it comes to a field watch. Of course, everybody loves loom, but you know what? It's really only gonna be super necessary when you're thinking about a dive watch, which this actually isn't, but it is a really nice uh, bonus, as you can see. Really great orientation because the 12 o'clock does have a slightly different triangle that is split into three sections versus the two sections there at the three, six, and nine. But one thing I always like to work in is a bit of a low light transition because you're not always gonna be out in the middle of a field enjoying direct sunlight. A lot of times you're gonna find yourself coming in and out of buildings, walking underneath overhangs, or just hanging out underneath the shade of a tree. So it's nice to see what these colors, textures, and finishes render like in less than optimal lighting to maybe include a little bit of harsh lighting, which simply could expose any types of production defects. But all you're gonna notice here is probably a couple of extra fingerprints on that beautiful high polished finish, which is gonna be preserved quite well thanks to that Dia Shield super hard coating. So very nice. And man, that dial is super black. Look at how deep and black that renders. It's not like a matte dial where you're going to have certain areas where it's going to wash out or appear some type of anthracite gray. Uh, all you're going to see is look at that. I like the way the, uh, the light glides over that second's hand. So very, a very restrained look here, very classic and uh, really just quite beautiful. And again, this is a watch from 1959 in terms of its design aesthetic. So it's not something where it's this big homage piece and they're trying to, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel or do any type of reverse engineering of a Rolex Explorer. This is an actual Explorer's watch from back in the day when they were still kind of deciding what an Explorer's watch was. And Seiko's take on it ended up being very, very nice and, you know, pretty popular and even more popular uh, when you get uh, into the modern era of something like, let's say, the Sarb 017 with its uh, gilt dial green uh, layout as well as those cathedral hands, uh, which really are reminiscent of the very niche and very very collectible red alpinist line with the 4s uh, movements that were actually a bit of a higher beat similar to this one so a lot to like here guys but closing thoughts on the wrist it definitely wears similar to something like a 36 millimeter rolex explorer but of course on a leather strap um so i think yeah again this is the perfect candidate for something like a forstner rivet bracelet so if you do 
do that if you're somebody who's out there watching this just because you're like oh i have that watch let's see what this reviewer has to say about it hey pair it with a force in her bracelet then tag me on the instagram wristwatch check because i would just love to see that now in terms of model variants there are a ton of new alpinist variations out now and you know but at the same time there's no other direct variations of this particular spec so it's not like they released this one and they released a blue dial variation with you know a black strap or anything like that right this is pretty much a one of one um, and I'm not sure if it will stay that way. They could do some other variations. This is definitely more of a reissue slash recreation, but they could do some reimaginings and I think it would be pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, this one is limited to under 2,000 pieces, and they're actually still available new, and this one is available new, and even at a discount, so uh, definitely think, uh, you know, consider that if you are shopping for these. In terms of uh, comparable models, you know, this is a real premium alternative to the usual field watch suspects. Um, and, you know, while on the smaller side for my 7.5 inch wrist, I think the more compact size will absolutely be a highlight for smaller wrists who really might have found the modern alpinist to be quite thick quite large wide and and just maybe a little overbearing in terms of that extra water resistance that extra robust case build um <clears throat> this is definitely something that i could see people really really enjoying as is especially if you have a smaller wrist you take that back plate a back uh plate kind of off of the bun strap and you could wear this as is with a smaller wrist and it's gonna look really really tasty oh my gosh this is a very very handsome watch again don't let the date window kind of spoil the you don't throw the baby out with the bath water like that's just one feature that people are not crazy about but i mean again they do have it with a black date disc uh with the white font over so at least it does mellow and and kind of goes unnoticed most of the time so for me guys bottom line uh while the offset date may turn off more than a few collectors i'd say it actually primes this piece for possible greater greater future collectability with design quirks that may scare off casual buyers and make way for only the most hardcore of collectors to appreciate so these might you know you might be able to get them at a really good deal like let's say this particular one from uh, belmont watches and you can have it, wear it, have fun with it. And, you know, who knows, five to ten years from now, these could be all the rage. And honestly, it's a lot of those weird watches that do end up, right? Just like that Sarb 017 being quite an odd watch, um, you know, by its own merits, uh, caught a lot of attention. And not everybody was crazy about their roulette wheel and an internal compass bezel, cathedral hands. It, it's an odd watch for sure. It even had a really bad leather strap. This has... A really outstanding one so uh yeah you never know what's going to become collectible but i think typically you do find the stuff that is kind of quirky but still high quality and has a lot of let's say uh features that are um you know that are just great features it's not subjective like they're objectively good features this watch objectively is well made with great features um i think some of those subjective things can change in terms of viewpoints over time but let me know what you guys think in the comments below if you like the video please do it like and if you haven't already please subscribe for more content just like this thanks guys yeah.